lethal dose in seconds. You take that and you dissolve it in acid and you liquefy it. And then, in the liquid form, you kind of tease out chemically the stuff you want, which in this case would be uranium and plutonium. That's what got built up in the spent fuel. And then the rest of the stuff becomes the new radioactive waste, which unfortunately now is a liquid. Before it was a solid, now it's a liquid. So you have to re-solidify it and deal with that and find a hole in the ground for that. So you're not really getting rid of this idea of a radioactive waste dump site. You're complicating the process using acid, using toxic materials. But most importantly, you are recovering materials that can be used for nuclear weapons. Because the plutonium that comes out of spent fuel and reprocessing is perfectly eligible for the creation of nuclear weapons. That's exactly how India got its bomb in the 1970s. And that sure made the Pakistanis feel good. So they did the exact same thing. They used the peaceful nuclear industry they had. They reprocessed the fuel they had, sucked out the plutonium, enriched the uranium, and made their own bombs. This is how the cycle goes. Everywhere you have reprocessing, you are at least eligible to join the nuclear weapons club. And it's happened over and over again across the planet. So for us, reprocessing is off the table. The official national policy is to dispose of the waste permanently forever in a geological repository, not reprocess. And why? Because when you use those assets, when you use those methods, you create proliferation of nuclear materials for weapons, and you create whole other new kinds of pollution. This is a breeder reactor in Japan, the Manju reactor, a fairly new reactor, which is not working well. This is actually one of the reprocessing facilities that just opened up in the last year or so, but they had to shut it down because of the earthquake two years ago. There were huge demonstrations to keep Rokasho, which is the reprocessing facility, from opening. Uh, oh, sorry, this character. Uh, Manju was a breeder reactor which opened in 1995. And because of its unique design to breed more of this radioactive material like plutonium, uh, it really became a proliferation problem. It also used a reactor design which is inherently kind of unstable compared to what we use now. And it had a severe accident in 1995 and, and it was closed for 10 years. They started to reopen it again the 2000s, and they had an industrial accident where they dropped a huge piece of machinery into the reactor and jammed it in there, and they don't know how to get it out. So they have this $20 billion machine sitting in Japan that they can't operate. That's the breeder site of this. The Rokasho site is the site of the processing facility, and the one in France at La Hague is uh, notorious in international circles. This is the last remaining ongoing recycling facility outside of the one in Russia. Uh, Japan uses it, Germany used to use it. And this facility now has about 90 tons of plutonium separated out, sitting mm -hmm. on the shores of the English Channel with no place to go. Mm -hmm. It takes about four pounds to make a nuclear weapon. They have 90 tons of it. So they have done the work of the terrorists for them. They have retrieved the material that the terrorists would really want, <coughs> which they couldn't get at when it was a spent fuel because they would have died. We did their chemical work for them and separated it out and have it in drums now. Worse, this facility is allowed to discharge its radioactive uh, liquids directly into the English Channel. Boom. And a number of years ago, Ireland and 11 other nations in the European Union took France to, before the International Court of Justice and tried to seek an injunction because the radioactive materials were turning up in Scandinavia from La Havre. The court did not rule on the petition because they claimed they were not the proper jurisdiction. So we never got a legal ruling on whether France should really shut this process down or not because it was the wrong jurisdiction. But it gives you an idea that reprocessing is not clean technology. Greenpeace fought for decades to change the law of the sea to prevent the dumping of toxic materials in barrels into the ocean. Because prior to that, France and England and others were taking that radioactive waste 
putting in 55 gallon drums and dumping it over the sides of ships. Greenpeace stopped that process. So what did France do? They put the pipeline into the English Channel. And it's perfectly legal. So if you can't dump in the ocean in a barrel, you can get away with it if your pipe is on. people swim on beaches? This is France. They do everything. <laughs> not quite so green. These are some of the barrels that got dumped overboard. You can see what maybe not from the back, but um, let's see if we can make this bigger. Yeah. Got rid of that annoying voice aside from mine. So this is an example of some of the barrels that are broken open under water. Um, there's a terrific French movie called De Shade. I don't speak French, so I hope I pronounce Wait. that correctly. Um, which was done by a French-German um, outfit called Arta. It's sort of like their version of Frontline. And it's a terrific documentary that talks about the Hague. And they point out that the day-to-day operations of the Hague is like an ongoing small nuclear uh, disaster in Europe. Because as they throw stuff up into the atmosphere from the vents, they can actually trace the radionuclides in the air as they come down on monitoring stations at the various universities across Europe. And they can tell the fingerprint because of the type of radionuclides that are coming in the scat. So you can actually trace Lahad's operation across Europe in the university system. So what's coming up? Well, I told you a bunch of horror stories already. Uh, we're going to be dealing with the centralized interim storage issue. There'll be an effort to build small modular reactors. Some of you may have heard of thorium reactors or some things. That will be coming up in the near future. In the state, we have to change the renewable portfolio law here. There's a, been a problem with the, the way it's set up now uh, because of the aggregation of electric utilities by smaller communities, creating a disincentive to make new renewable power. So we have to correct that in Illinois. We talked about some of the decommissioning problems at Zion and elsewhere. And the safety concerns, the Mark I reactors that we have addressed in Quad Cities, the vents, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And quite honestly, the last two, which you may not be able to read in the back there, we are going to take the NRC to task finally. When I was in Washington with my colleagues last weekend, we visited 10 of the 18 Illinois delegation offices, and we told them, look, this has just happened since January. It's your job to monitor this federal agency and make sure they do their job right. And if you don't, we're going to have to make this a public issue, whether it's during the election campaign or whatever. It's up to Congress to pull the leash on NRC to protect the public health and safety. So we're initiating the campaign to do that. And then finally, I said it earlier, I want you, if you, if you don't take anything away from tonight, understand Fukushima is not over. It will not be over for at least 50 years until we get that fuel out of the pools, until we move it somewhere, until those buildings are structurally secured and the reactors that have melted down are cleaned up. We have to stop the continued dumping of radioactive materials in the Pacific Ocean, which is ongoing. You may have heard the um, little horror story a week or so ago where these plastic tanks that they had put there temporarily to hold radioactive water sprung a leak. And tens of thousands of gallons of highly radioactive water was sloshing around the, the grounds of Fukushima. And it rains and we get washed into the Pacific Ocean. It turns out the thickness of the plastic they were using, if any of you are painters, you probably wouldn't use that on your paint jobs. <coughs> One mil thickness for some of these containers. What do we recommend? And then we'll wrap up the questions. Phase out the nuclear as quickly as possible. First thing, especially the Fukushima type reactors. We have 23 of them in the United States, four in Illinois. We should transition to what we call a carbon free, nuclear free energy system. And we don't have the time to get into the details tonight, but we can come back and talk about that another time. If not nuclear, what? But we do have some books and materials on the energy future we want. We have to begin the process of getting that spent fuel out of the wet pools, move them into hardened on-site storage on site, and then do a credible process to find the permanent disposal facility. 
we need a new power grid as well because what we have is deteriorating. That's the huge spider web of wires that you see connecting to the, drug, to the Byron nuclear station and others. It's old, it's vulnerable, and we need a qualitatively new kind of design that will better accommodate the renewable energy that we are proposing, wind power, solar power, things like that. And it can be done. It is being done in Europe. It is going to be done in Japan. We can and should do it here. And Scientific American has published two or three articles in the last four years documenting how that happened. So we can do it. And somebody say, yes, we can. <laughs> Let's see it. Uh, yes. uh, this is a specific protection that we also recommend. CME stands for Coronal Mass Ejection. This has been in the news the last year, year and a half, as the solar cycle has been on the increase. The sun is constantly throwing off uh, particles and things, but occasionally there are these huge eruptions of plasma coming off the surface of the sun. Depending on where it comes off, it's going to head out in different directions. If it's big enough, and if it's heading towards us, it can really wreak havoc on the surface of the Earth. This actually happened in the 1800s, <coughs> where we had very primitive electrical systems then, but all of the telegraph systems in the world went out. In fact, some transformers and things exploded. Uh, the, the telegraph operators, some of them got an electric shock because, these, because of this coronal mass ejection that occurred. They're afraid with this current solar cycle, if it's big enough, that you could induce currents on the ground which could fry out some of our electrical system here. And we learned, hopefully from Japan and elsewhere, that when you short out the power grid, you remove the power at the reactor sites to keep the spent fuel pools full. So this is very serious. If they don't have backup power at the reactor sites, or enough of it for a long enough period of time, you could in induce a meltdown when really every reactor site affected by those failed grids. So we need to create a grid that's more resistant to this kind of coronal mass ejection in the future. In Almost there. Thanks for being patient. Put this in another uh, presentation. Again, it's small letters, so I'll read it out loud. Nuclear reactors are nothing more than highly specialized, potentially catastrophically dangerous, very expensive TPEDs. Using a modernized version of 18th century technology called the steam cycle to boil water to make steam, that's all you're getting for your $6 billion a pop for today's modern nuclear reactors, is a big tea kettle, which creates radioactive waste which lasts for 10,000 years. So you're not getting anything magical out of those nuclear reactions that give you electricity. You are simply boiling water. And we think there are better ways to boil water. But we should be asking the question, do we need to boil water? Are there other ways to get electrons? Do we need to boil that much water? These are questions that we have not been able to ask for a long time. It's time we started. So that's pretty much our conclusion. Our feeling about nuclear power. Hell of a way to boil water. And on Earth Day, when you see the radiation symbol, understand that we are the center of the cavern and we need to do something about it. What can you do? Lots of things. The doors will be locked until each of you picks up paper and figure. And the guy on the outside has a taser, so you don't have to find paper. Anyway, help yourself to the paper birds. We slaughtered dozens of trees. You have to justify their deaths by taking the paper with you and reading it, and then giving it to somebody else and talking about it. We are willing to come out and show additional films, engage in debates, uh, have other kinds of discussions. Uh, we do house parties at people's homes if they really want that. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, we are available to do classwork. I've done several presentations here at Northern in the past at an environmental uh, journalism class that mm -hmm. was uh, conducted here by Dr. Ian Duffkin. So we want to come out and talk. Bottom line is, you know, you've got to do your part. You've got to ask us, you've got to fight with us. You, know, you have to argue with us, you have to be skeptical. You have to not believe a word I said, like I said earlier. And find out some of this stuff on your own, and then make some 
inform decisions based on what's coming up. So, our contact information is on all of our literature. Go to our website, you'll see lots of other materials that are not here. Uh, events, there's a calendar of events, so the things that are coming up all throughout the region. Hope to see you again. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here. <laughs> What are the recorded effects of the Chernobyl accident on people and on nature? Recorded effects. I'm a little light on following the literature on that. I do know there have been some recently released studies on plants and animals in the area. We do know, for example, also that bluefin tuna carried radioactive across the Pacific Ocean and were harvested off the coast of California. We do know that 100,000, 160,000 people are potentially permanently displaced. We do know that uh, Japanese children recently have been examined and have found to have statistically higher, higher observed numbers of thyroid nodules forming than other children of the same age group uh, in other parts of Japan that were not affected. Beyond that, I wouldn't want to hazard anymore because I don't know much. Um, I, I believe at some point the comparison needs to be made with what happened after Chernobyl. And even there, there's a huge controversy over health effects, over exposures, and whatever, uh, which we can get into in some detail. But we found so far the Japanese government to be fairly duplicitous, uh, not informing people, not doing a very good job on the evacuation, not administering potassium iodide properly and thoroughly. Uh, and what worries us even more now is the cleanup. Because the people who are being hired for cleanup are nowhere near getting the safety measures they need to protect themselves from the contamination that they're really exposed to. In many cases, these are unemployed people desperate for work who don't get a lot of training, don't get masks. They wear the masks, they don't know how to use them necessarily. They don't have proper detection equipment. Um, it's, it's not a very um, pleasant scenario. And we were talking at dinner about this, just to let you know. Uh, one concern that we have is just like in this country, um, there are certain industries in the United States which uh, generously are described as being operated by the company. When I read between the lines on that, it means the mafia runs the waste disposal system in the country. Don't think it's any different in Japan. They just call it Yakuza. And we're very concerned about the infiltration of the Yakuza in dominating the cleanup operation around the region. We know it won't be done responsibly. So I can't give you more than that now. We do hear reports, for example, one came out recently from the World Health Organization. We have issues with the World Health Organization because we discovered after Chernobyl that the WHO, WHO, has a agreement <coughs> with another international agency called the IAEA. International Atomic Energy Agency. And that agreement goes back to the 1950s or 60s. And what it says is that if either agency is going to do a study and it has results that might have an effect on the mission of the other agency, the other agency has the ability to preemptively hold that document from publication. And we found that the IABA did that the World Health Organization after Chernobyl, meaning in English, 
And we're very suspicious that a lot of very unpopular health effects got squashed. So we're not exactly fully trusting on results coming out of the World Health Organization. Okay, what are questions, comments? Uh, besides the NPT, are there any other international law or treaties that mainly treat a lot of that that apply to your safety? That, I mean, I know if the ICJ is kind of here's something like that. Is there any other? Is there any law that comes? Could you uh, flesh out the acronyms for those who are uh, not familiar? Not proliferation. NPT. No. Is, is there anything besides that in international law, such as like treaties that apply to? safety at all. If, there, if the ICJ won't hear a case like that, then what's the proper form? Good question. Uh, I guess the World Court, the International Court, yeah. um, I don't, there's a difference between the World Court and the International Court of Justice, correct? I think they're pretty much the same. Okay, but are, I guess there was one that was European and one was international. But that, that was a reference I meant earlier. No. But, um, the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, is a UN-based organization, and they only, their mission is to promote nuclear power. There is a whole board of like about their mission as I know about mine. They have no authority to go into any country that has not signed a non-proliferation treaty. And even if they did, they have no jurisdiction to order anything shut down. They can only make strong recommendations Hopefully the local entity will take action on that. Now beyond that, I guess you could go before the World Court to take the United Nations. Uh, the, it would be good, I, I suppose I should refresh myself on a lot of the provisions of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, but I would point out that as long as a nation is abiding by standards set by the IAEA, any nation has the legal right to have permission to follow and operate which is why I get a little dusty about people who are upset about Iran. You could argue that they're not fully complying with international guidelines. That could be contested. But no one can argue that they are not beyond their right to pursue nuclear power through the non proliferation treaty. Unlike Israel, unlike Pakistan, and unlike India, we have not signed. So I really can't answer your question fully. Um, but that, that I just want to get across the idea that that's probably the only jurisdiction and the only regulatory body out there really can't force anybody. They have no legal authority to shut the plant down or anything like that. And as you saw during the Gulf War, can be asked by a host nation to leave. And they have to go. Sorry. Yes. I have a small comment. Uh, I'm actually from Ukraine. My name is Ivan, and thank you for the presentation, and thanks for invitation. And uh, your presentation was very interesting. Uh, I opened for, for me uh, lots of information that I didn't know. And just to give you uh, just a perspective from Ukraine, uh, when the Chernobyl occurred, I was only five months old, and so I, I don't remember what, what happened, but I just know what I... Uh, what my parents told me from other people, what I can see in the news and from documentaries, that lots of people, thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people in Ukraine were affected, including those who were uh, working on the on the site uh, when it happened, and other people who got their radioactive, uh, you know, uh, this radiation, and thousands of people uh, have cancer and so on. So I, I'm not talking about research now is just uh, what what I saw what I heard in the news so uh, this nuclear uh, power is a really expensive uh, uh, power and electricity I mean expensive in terms of lives and how how dangerous it is and uh, as we heard in, in, in your presentation uh, for thousands of years tens of thousands of years uh, this energy will be uh, could pollute our airs and environment. So it's really dangerous, and uh, so uh, really we, we should think about uh, how dangerous it is, how expensive it will be for us to uh, to do something with this uh, nuclear uh, waste. Yeah. I want to thank 
thank you for sharing that. Do you mind uh, what uh, city in Ukraine are you from? Uh, I'm from Ukraine. the Western Ukraine, the uh, Chernivtsi uh, city, mm -hmm. and it, it's about uh, 400 miles, uh, maybe 300 miles from the Chernobyl site. And uh, in, in some time after this uh, Chernobyl occurred, so my parent, uh, there was a case of uh, some disease in our city when kids were losing their hair, mm -hmm. and my parents sent me to, to our relatives to Russia because they thought it would be more safe over there. And that's why I spent some time uh, there. But uh, other than that, kids were affected and uh, lots of people were affected. And I know that lots of people who are associ associated with Chernobyl got cancer, different uh, types of cancer, and were dying every year. And the population associated with Chernobyl is decreasing uh, every year because of the, and this. Thank you for sharing that. How many miles was your home from Chernobyl? So about 300 uh, miles. And so you come to school uh, 29 miles from Barron. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would mention uh, in 2006, I was in Kiev for mm. the 20th anniversary. And a very interesting thing occurred. The International Safe Energy and Anti-Nuclear Community was hosting a 20-year conference where we were inviting the doctors from Western Ukraine, Southern Belarus, Western Russia, in the field, the ones who had to deal with the health effects for our conference and hearing their stories, documenting what was going on. Across the street from us was the official United Nations, IAEA 20th anniversary, which they reported, well, maybe over the next so many decades, maybe 4,000 people might die. And it's okay to go eat the food and come back. And I'm surprised Disney hasn't bought the, the property to put up a theme park now to treat it down uh, so cavalierly. The point is, uh, in the 1990s, Yuri Sherbach, if I may pronounce his name wrong, but uh, he was um, at that time an ambassador to the United States from Ukraine was saying it was very likely that at least 30,000 people had died. That was the claim being made by Greenpeace. And many other Eastern doctors have made studies, released reports, that say the numbers are fantastically higher than what we hear in the West. And that's for two reasons. There's been a real barrier getting the studies translated from the Eastern European languages to the West. And secondly, there's a difference in how their literature is set up uh, and is accepted as uh, what we would consider peer review compared to the way we do it. So we have this kind of attitude of our peer review system is not it's so good that it kind of excludes whatever concerns they would raise. So you have this kind of prejudice on the medical data that's out there. But uh, as, as he pointed out, there are, depending on the estimates, anywhere from six to 800,000 liquidators who were working on the Chernobyl disaster. In four days, if anybody even bothers to report on the 27th anniversary of the death of the disaster this coming week, you'll hear the usual, oh, there was a disaster where 35 to 37 people died, mostly firefighters. It's one of the most blatant distortions of history on the books. It's like denying the Holocaust. It's like saying World War II was that unfortunate event where on December 7th, 2,000 sailors and marines died in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and forget the rest. So you have to be more critical when you see these news accounts, and I would encourage you to write letters to the editors of any paper that publishes that, or any TV station who says that, and challenge them. 